Welcome back to Fractal Aerodynamics. This is a video podcast discussing a new approach describing fluid dynamics. But before you watch this episode, I recommend you to watch the introducing chapter who gives a comprehensive overview over the content of this channel. This is now chapter 3 and in this chapter I will dig deeper into the physics of fluids. I will analyze the currently established theories and the fundamental idea on what they are built resulting into the current understanding of fluid motion. First I will track down the contradiction and provide evidence why this leads to a wrong interpretation of fluid behavior. This contradiction builds the origin why different effects in fluid like turbulence behave paradox. Thus they are not understood in their nature still today. But let me shortly rephrase the content of the last chapter. In the last chapter I have developed a finite element simulation to model flow behavior. Then I compared the model to wind tunnel experiments. With our final conclusion that reason for lift is the atmospheric pressure which accelerates the flow back to the surface and deflects it. I have shown that this feature has certain constraints based on the inertial effects of air. This causes lift to happen only on low angles of the attack. The more the angle rises or speed drops, the more likely the air can manage to revolve inside the low pressure area. Ergo, lift is an unstable condition caused by mass inertia. And now in the third chapter, I will look on the existing theories and which considerations led to the claims of what they are constructed. So what were the motivations and observation that led the forefathers to their ideas of their potential theory? When Bernoulli brought his hydrodynamica, he summarized his experiences with water games at the courts of the Tsars and other places. Remarkably, many of his experiments have to do with flowing water in the gravitational field. Giovanni Battista Venturi, who experimentally confirmed many of Bernoulli's theories, also worked in a similar way. From the modern point of view, it seems more than logical that there were no mechanical pumps at this time who make fluid motion less dependent from gravity. So it seems obvious to assign a potential to this pressure, since it was also usual in Newton mechanics. At that time, fluid were mainly studied on pipe flows. One of the most central theses, the connection between dynamic and static pressure, is also justified by the law of conservation of energy, also now under the law of Bernoulli. This can be well studied on a Venturi nozzle. But before I resolve the contradictions, first a little experiment. Have you ever tried to suck a feather or a fuzzle with a vacuum cleaner? You probably noticed the very short range of effect. The feather gets sucked in only very close to the mouth of the tube. But the other way around you can easily blow a feather meters away. Shouldn't it behave the same way when sucking than when blowing? The potential theory says so. But as you can see it does not. So why doesn't the flute behave symmetric? because actually this would be the correct behavior for potential fluid. Energy gets transformed from an energy potential into motion and back again. The nature of all fields. Take for example a magnetic field. It attracts and repels objects the same way. But why are fluid that different? For that let's look a bit closer to what drove the forefathers of fluid dynamics like Bernoulli, Venturi or D'Alembert to their conclusions. Yes, energy conservation. Though energy, con energy conservation was established first in the 19th century, these guys already thought, well, what comes in that has to come out. So the conclusion lies nearly that when a fluid under pressure with a certain speed enters a section with a given diameters, 
then it also exists, that section, with the same speed and pressure, because energy has to conserve. But what happens when there is a constriction inside the tube? Without doubt, there has to happen an acceleration of the fluid to maintain volume conservation. But where does that energy come from? The inventors of potential theory state it has to come from the static pressure of the fluid, which acts as a potential. So the conclusion, whenever there is a constriction, static pressure drops and gets transformed into a kinetic energy, also called dynamic pressure. A better theoretical analogy to picture the idea of potential fields are experiments with rigid bodies in the gravity field. The probably most obvious analogy to potential fields. Instead of pressure, we have their altitude as a constraining parameter between the gravity potential and motion. So when an object moves through the gravity field and in altitude, then energy gets transformed from the gravitational energy potential into kinetic energy back and forth. Likewise, it's the same with fluid motion, you got told. That's why it's still argued today. And whenever you start studying aerodynamics, be sure you won't get away from it. There will be a bunch of course tests torturing with these questions. But honestly, does this match your intuitive observation? What's wrong with the theory and the reality obviously won't match correctly. Is this looking to you as perfect symmetry of potential fields to you? Obviously not, but where lays the discrepancy and the indi first indication of a contrary behavior? Well, experts instead would tell you, yeah, it's uh, not that simple though. Symmetry only validates for perfect laminar stream. You have to consider Randall's theory of boundary layer, because all turbulence starts in the boundary layer. Boundary layer here? Okay, let's get serious again. Let's do some little math here. What does the potential theory state? It says that the pressure is conserved when a fluid passes through a tube with equal diameter. And this means that when including a narrow section, the fluid has to accelerate, but has to get back to its original stage after the constriction. By Newton's second law of motion, additional energy, or in another perspective, force, has to be added to overcome the inertia of mass in a narrow section. All forces in the mechanical system equilibrate. In a static mechanical system, all momentums and forces are zero. Also in fluids, pressure is a force without a direction. It's scalar. So when our static forces are zero, where does the force come from? And that is needed to accelerate the fluid through the narrow section from the great void. When the same pressure pushes at the exit of the narrow cross-section, it also pushes at the beginning and even in the middle. No mass whatsoever will move, because on each side, the narrow cross-section, the same pressure exits. Two powers pushing against each other, like two ram sheep, no one strong enough to defeat the other. If the potential theory works like stated, it would be also possible that Mithausen could pull himself out of the swamp on its ponytail. It thus would create lots of odd effect where it comes to a spontaneous motion, which, based on the second law of motion, can happen. But how is it in the dynamic case? The static forces are out of equilibrium. Thus, the unbalanced force is expressed in acceleration until new balance occurs, which means that mechanical system that can move needs force that are not equilibrate, so motion can happen. So the ultimate rule to motion requires unbalanced forces that the second law of motion can be meet. But hey, that kinetic energy came from the pressure, not? 
No, it doesn't. As we saw, all static forces equilibrate. They actually do not exist mathematically. Only the resulting force are calculated. So the other forces are equilibrated. They are then only a mindset to model mechanic dependency. All forces come from the external energy source, a piston or a pump, like on an hydraulic excavator. Very good example. So the final question is, if a dynamic motion only happens within an unbalanced mechanical system, what will happen in the diffuser part when the cross-section returns to its old diameter? How will the fluid return in its original state? Well, the short answer is, it won't. And there lays exactly the key why we still struggle with the understanding of fluid behavior, because we yet think fluid has to return into its original stage again. And thus the topic of the energy conservation in fluids is discussed only in that frame. It often has only subtle difference on which way you explain different effects, but at the end they make a huge difference in your model and finally decides what makes sense or not. It's like in the geocentric and the heliocentric cosmic model. Viewed from Earth perspective, they both seem to make sense, but in the cosmic perspective they make a huge difference, and even the calculation does. Calculating the planets in the sky with the geocentric model needed huge equations, while in the heliocentric it's very simple. So it's with the fluid dynamics. Describing fluid motion based on the potential model it's awkward and complex, and many effects like lift or turbulence are still not understood. Like with the cosmic model you will see in further chapters that with the fractal fluid model it also solves quite simple. Right now, these claims are only briefly introduced, but in the next chapter we will give them some more attention and match them with the current state of the art. So let me summarize this chapter. I have shown that even very simple experiments reveal features which are unusual for potential fields. Instead, it behaves asymmetric in a contracting situation, compared to an expanding one. If you have a mechanical system that has the same static forces pushing at the entrance and the exit, there is no chance that there is less force inside, because this would violate Newton's third law, actu equals reactio. Motion requires unbalanced forces that need to be balanced by mass inertia, so the pressure must drop constantly. Then once accelerated, through our constriction, the fluid momentum preserves under friction-free condition. This means incompressible fluids cannot carry a potential, because a potential represents a storage of energy which does not exist in an incompressible fluid. In reality, the work and thus energy is done by external components like pumps, piston, etc., which provide work and establish fluid pressure in a fluid system. That's so far for this chapter. I hope you liked it. See you in the next chapter where I will dig deeper into math and provide evidence why there has to be an unbalanced force system for a new energy conservation law that the fluid mechanics can be met. It also leads to entropy and so forth. I hope you I see you there. Stay tuned. Bye.